we remember the victory of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we raise our voices in praise and thanksgiving for your incomparable gift of love revealed in Christ's resurrection. We thank you for his promise that because he lives, we will live as well. We pray in his name. Amen. children, 
nor love as Christ loved us. Apart from you, we are nothing. Only your grace can sustain us. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us, heal us, and make us whole. Set us free from sin and restore to us the joy of your salvation now and forever. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Welcome to worship with the Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church on this second Sunday of Easter. Yes, we continue to be in the season of Easter. And we pray that through this time of worship this morning, you will continue to feel the, uh, the uh, new life, this new source of life, and the new power of life that comes to each one of us through the resurrection of Christ. If you are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary, we welcome you. Or if you join us through our live stream broadcast on Facebook or later in the day or at some other time during the week on our YouTube recording, please know that together we are one congregation of God's people gathered together for worship. Today's a, a day, a special day in life of our congregation because we welcome two very special friends and very talented individuals to our service this morning. It is a pleasure and privilege to welcome back to Cherry Hill today, Giles Simmer, who was with us, I believe, back earlier in the winter and who has returned to add to our continual celebration of Easter today. Giles um, per has performed in the chorus of the Michigan Opera Theater and with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. She has performed with opera companies in Detroit, at Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor, and throughout our area. She is a music instructor, teaches private lessons in Canton, and she currently serves as a staff singer at the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Detroit. So Giles, thank you for being with us again today. Uh, it is always a pleasure to have Giles with us. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to have Nicholas Welsh back as our guest organist today. 
Nicholas has been our guest organist now for about the past three years, as he reminded me last week. Um, Nicholas continues to uh, study. He's a senior at Divine Child High School here in Dearborn, just a few blocks away. He has served as substitute organist at several churches throughout the Archdiocese of Detroit, as well as he plays mass regularly at Divine Child. And Nicholas has been accepted and has agreed to, to uh, begin his studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor uh, beginning in the fall where he plans to study uh, organ, sacred music, and architecture. I told Nicholas he could only come back here and play if he were to attend the University of Michigan. <laughs> Nicholas put in the bulletin today that he thanks Charles and myself for inviting him back to Cherry Hill. Nicholas, Cherry Hill is grateful to have you with us again today. Uh, so, Nicholas and Giles, thank you for being with us. Our director of music and organist, uh, Charles Miller, has been enjoying a very well-deserved week of vacation this past week, uh, and he returns to the church on Wednesday and will be back with us next Sunday. I would encourage you to read the announcements that are in today's bulletin. Uh, I just remind those here in the sanctuary that we are not receiving an offering by passing offering plates just yet. Uh, but you are invited to uh, simply place your offering in the plates at all of the doors. If you're watching us online and would like to contribute to the ministry of Cherry Hill Church, you may do so through our online giving. Uh, which may be found on the home page of our website, www.cherryhillchurch.org. Again, welcome to worship as we continue to proclaim the good news that Christ is risen. Oh, you're getting pretty good. <laughs> our New Testament lesson this morning will be read from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15 verses 12 through 25. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that God raised Christ, whom God did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of most people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, so the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, then those who belong to Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jeff Reynolds for Magnificent so which happens to be my favorite aria from Boston. I think you've just heard the best sermon you're going to hear this morning, so we might as well just go home. But since tomorrow is I saw that day. But since tomorrow is payday, maybe we should stay just a little bit longer. Our gospel reading this morning will be read from the Gospel of John, first from chapter 11, verses 17 through verse 27. This reading comes during the time when Jesus raised his best friend Lazarus from the dead. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about her brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And this one verse from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 19, Jesus said, In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace, O God. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. The ritual in our home growing up never varied. In fact, it is so deep in my own soul that it surfaces every now and again, and I rehearse it mentally on occasions as I drift off to sleep, even now. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Usually, my mother was there to make sure I said the prayer, but sometimes she wasn't. But after those lines, there always followed a long list of people to bless. Mommy and Daddy, Matthew, my brother, grandparents on both sides, aunts and uncles, some other relatives, a hamster named Freddie or Stanley, later on a cat named Cleo, and an occasional neighbor or friend who might just need a little extra help from God. Over the years, this prayer has helped millions, maybe millions and millions of children get ready to go to bed. It's not that it's a bad prayer, it's a pretty good prayer, really, but it's that third line that always struck me as just a little bit unusual. If I should die before I wake. Now, it seems to me that little children, children in the springtime of life, children with so much life ahead of them, 
should even mention death in a bedtime prayer. But as I've grown older, I don't think it's odd at all. For death comes to all of us sooner or later. I love the story of the two golfers, Fred and Frank. Every time they would play golf, they debated as to whether or not there really was golf in heaven. They'd say, let's make a pact that whoever gets to heaven first will find a way to signal the other one still here as to whether or not there really is golf in heaven. Well, Fred died first. He goes up to heaven, and he comes to Frank in a dream. Fred says, well, Frank, I've got good news and bad news for you. Frank said, well, let's have the good news first. Fred said, well, guess what, Frank? There really is golf in heaven. Frank said, that's great. But what's the bad news? Fred said, well, Frank, you tee off at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> Maybe I should have gone on vacation this week, too. <laughs> but there is one thing. There is one thing that no matter how old we are, no matter where we live, no matter what the color of our skin or the sound of our language or the names of the gods before whom we bend our knees, there is one thing that we all have in common. We are all in the process of dying. It begins the day we're born. Carl Sandburg said that the, that the statistics on death are pretty impressive, 100%. Good. And yet we don't like to talk about that. We don't like to think about that. But is it not foolish not to speak or think or, or think or speak of that which concerns us so drastically? especially as we continue to bask in the beautiful afterglow of Easter. In the Old Testament, in the book of Job, we hear Job's famous words, which are part of a poignant prayer of his when he's at the bottom of the worst. In great despair, Job cries out, if a mortal dies, and in that moment he expected to die, if a mortal dies, shall he live again? Now, I'm sure that if we were to be honest enough, we would have to admit that we've all asked that question in some form or another from time to time. For don't we all want to know? I mean, each one of us wants to know if it's true if it's really true. Not just ceremonially, ceremonially true, not just symbolically true, not just liturgical true, but is it literally out of this world true that this life is not the end and that God has so much more planned for us? Is it then any wonder that we can't help but wonder from time to time, what's, what's beyond this life? And so we make our way back to old Job's question, if a mortal die, or more to the point, if I die, shall I live again? If I should die before I wake. Well, of course, there's always one problem with dealing with that kind of question. The problem is that any time we deal with immortality or its dark side death, the problem is that none of us have any first-hand information about that. 
Now I know you're going to be quick to come back at me and remind me that over the years all kinds of books and articles have been written and numerous documentaries and, and movies have been filmed that explain, if not prove, that there's life after life. I've read the books. I've seen some of the documentaries. But if you've ever really listened to the people who have written the paperbacks, or who have made the TV documentaries. Just listen to what they write or say. I, I, I don't know if I believe everything they tell me. For you see, it all comes down to a matter of belief. It all comes down to a matter of faith. It's still a faith commitment. You see, when it's all said and done, we place our trust, our hope, and our faith in the love and the power of God, which can not be defeated, as demonstrated in the resurrection of Christ. Jesus came here and he offered us a promise. He said, did you hear it? Because I live, you shall live also. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus told us that what we call death will never take precedence over what he calls life. Yes, when it's all said and done, we Christians do not have some neat little well-worked-out theory that proves that we live after we die. All that we have is a Savior who did it. That's it. He simply did it. And having done it, he comes to the mouth of an empty grave and he answers Job's age-old question by declaring, Because I live, you shall live also. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now that's quite a promise, isn't it? As we continue to celebrate Easter, I'd like to suggest to you today that there may be a way for us to deal with this whole subject of death and immortality through an experience that's far clearer in understanding to us. It's, it's something else that's common to every single one of us. None of us has escaped it, I promise you. It's the experience of birth. Each one of us began as a dab of transparent jelly, smaller than a grain of sand, and yet all the potential for life was there, body, mind, and spirit. In time, the cells began to grow and divide until little by little we were miraculously formed into a little baby. We were formed into a baby who would anticipate ultimately being born out of the womb, that perfect environment, into a whole other world. But what could life in some other world possibly be like? In the womb, we lived without breathing. How could we possibly live with breathing? In the, in the womb, we lived in the dark. How could we possibly live in a world with so much brightness? You know, if we had understood it then, perhaps the event that seems so delightful to us already in this world, the great event of birth, had we the wit when we were in the womb, being born would have surely looked to us a lot like that leaving the only world we knew for literally what God only knows. 
And yet we know now that that womb was doing nothing other than preparing us for that other world. And we were being prepared. In the darkness, eyes were being formed for light we had never seen. In that aquatic stillness, ears were being formed for sounds we had never heard. In that airless environment, lungs were being formed for oxygen we had never breathed. In that intellectual hiatus, brain cells were being readied for thoughts we'd never had. Isn't that remarkable? We were being made ready. Isn't it remarkable that in that perfect environment of the womb, we were being prepared for another world, another way of life? Now, I wonder, and bear with me for just a moment, but I wonder, what if this life right now that we're in I wonder if it's not something like a womb. I'm talking about this actual world that we live in, in a world of blossoming daffodils, in a world of sickness and division and war and pandemic and countless other problems. This actual world, this, actually, this actual life that we know right now, what if all of this were for those of us who believe, what if this world and this life were a womb fashioning us as clearly right now for a world just beyond, for a life to come, just as our mother's womb prepared us for life in this world? And here's something else to think about. If our birth into this world was a terrifying event, as I think it must have been, what were our first feelings and sensations? Firm hands underneath us, loving eyes looking down at us. There was warmth and nourishment and security and lots of love. At home, a room was made ready for us place to sleep, toys to be played with, and all the things necessary to care for us were there. Someone knew we were coming. They prepared a place for us. Now, I cannot believe for even a half a second that the God who was so meticulously careful to plan for our entrance into this world is going to be somehow careless about our entrance into the next. I don't know about you, but I find great hope and great comfort in the words of the Apostle Paul, I has not seen nor ear heard nor human heart conceived if not in this worldly room at any way. What God has prepared for those who love God. You know, I find it so interesting that death is one of the most devastating fears that so many people endure. For some, it's the ultimate worst fear. However, for those who live on this side of the resurrection, we can put that fear away. Old death was beaten the day it took on Jesus Christ, and poor old death hasn't been the same since. Death no longer has the stuff in it to scare even skittery folks like you and me. At least not a fool with you. I am the resurrection and the life. Because I live, you shall live also. Do you believe this? I'm sure that many of you will remember the name of Peter Marshall. The Reverend Dr. Peter Marshall came to this country in 1927 as a poor Scottish immigrant. 
And within 19 years, he rose to the position of chaplain of, these, of, this, of, the, of the United States Senate. He began his ministry in this country down in Atlanta, Georgia, and then later he was called to be the pastor of the uh, historic New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. He was called to New York Avenue in 1937. While serving that church, Peter Marshall's voice and ministry reached its greatest power and its greatest audience. And then from 1947 until 1949, he held the appointment as Senate chaplain and transformed what had been a rather insignificant position into a vital and active part in the life of the Senate. At 3.30 in the morning of January 25th, 1949, Peter Marshall awakened with severe chest pains. He woke his wife, Catherine, and informed her that she should call the doctor. In the middle of the night, an, a, 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 an ambulance was summoned to transport Dr. Marshall to the hospital. It was decided that Catherine Marshall should remain at the manse with her four young children. In time, the ambulance arrived and was waiting just outside the front door. And as the two orderlies were carrying Dr. Marshall out, they stopped for just a moment. They put the stretcher down. And Peter Marshall looked up at his beloved wife, Catherine, and smiled through his pain and said, Darling, I'll see you in the morning. And at 8.15 a.m. on January 25th, the great Peter Marshall was born into life eternal. That afternoon, Catherine Marshall sent a telegram to family and friends that simply read, Peter fell asleep today. We'll see him in the morning. I can't help but wonder if that's not the way it will be. I wonder if perhaps on the last night that we have in this worldly womb that we just won't go to sleep in those great everlasting arms of God. And when we are next to where we'll still be in those great everlasting arms of God. And all the light and life and love of eternity will be splashing all around us. And then in a steady, strong voice, we'll hear the voice of God say, My child. It's morning. That's the promise of a resurrection faith. That's the promise that Jesus has given to you and to me and to all those who would believe in him. The promise that because I live, you will live also. I go to prepare a place for you. Or as someone has said, death is not extinguishing the light. It's merely putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And because he lives, we will live also. Thanks be to God.
tradition of those who have gone before us in the faith, let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Our good and eternal God, who catches us and saves us with a surprising, irresistible gift of grace, we give you thanks for how we see your grace living and acting in our world and in our lives. How we know your loving spirit in the astonishing sunrise of wonder the wonder of warmer mornings and the great promise of spring, the wonder of the potential of life growing into fullness of life lived, the wonder of life lived leading us to the promise of life eternal, rooted and grounded in our Lord and life giver, Jesus Christ. O oh God, you call us to participate in the life you offer to the world, and as partners in the new order of life you have brought. And so we pray for the world and for your church, and ask that you would strengthen us and guide us. May we live into a life of empathy, ordering our lives according to your command to treat the other as we would wish to be treated. Open our hearts to respond to those who suffer. Open our ears to hear the cry of the oppressed and the fearful. We pray for the world in all of its beauty and brokenness. Let peace break out in the places of war. Hope insert itself into the places of desolation. Unity in the midst of division. And may life assert its dominion over death. We pray for the church in all its names and all its places for its continuing usefulness as a channel of grace and hope, for its rescue from pretentiousness and pomposity, and for taking some things more seriously than is helping. We commend to you our families and our friends. We pray for those who are happy today, and those who know sadness or fear. Bless the sick with hope and healing. Bless those who care for them and who love them with your strength. And may they know that peace, even in the midst of worry and wonder and concern. And comfort those who are close to death with the promise of your undying love. O oh Lord of 
resurrection power. Remind us that Easter is just not one day on the calendar. Rather, every morning is a little Easter. Every morning comes to us as a new day filled with hope and possibility. Every morning comes to us as a gift from you. Remind us, there has not been a day yet. There has not been a darkness so deep or a night so long that the promising rays of a new day have not been able to scatter. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of this life until the shadows lengthen and the, and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who teaches us to pray together, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Support the weak, 
help the suffering, honor, serve, and love one another even as God in Christ has loved us. Go out claiming the good news of Easter. Go out claiming the promise that because he lives, we shall live also. Go out claiming the promise that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we shall live forever. So as you go, may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love and with all those whom nobody loves, today and on all the days yet to be. Amen.